Mark chapter number 4. We'll begin reading in verse 35. The Bible says, And the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind cease, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for this day you've made. Thank you for allowing us to be in church. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us from the Scriptures. We have enjoyed the good singing. We enjoyed the good Sunday school class. But, Lord, I pray you'd meet with us now. I pray if there's any in our midst today, that today would be the day of their salvation if they're lost and undone. I pray for the saints of God today. Lord, you alone know what they have faced this past week. You know the test and the the turmoils and the tiredness and all that they have had to endure. But Lord, they found themselves in the house of God this morning. I pray you'd refresh their spirit. I pray that, Lord, you'd restore their bodies and minds. But most importantly, I pray you'd revive their hearts. And Lord, may we leave out of here different than we came in. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for being so faithful. And thank you for being a true and dear friend. Have your will and way amongst us now. Use this unworthy vessel. Bless now as only you can. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. And amen. I want to look at this text and look at some things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice really the key is found in verse 35. Notice the promise. The Bible said that he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Now when God says it, you can bank on it, friend. And here the Lord Jesus tells them they're passing to the other side. But in the midst of the journey, things don't go the way that they thought they would go, and they lose sight of the promise. So many times we too are faced with things that we were not expecting, and the first thing we do is begin to doubt God and what God said. We see the promise. I want you to notice the pack of others in verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitudes, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with them other little ships. Can I say the Lord Jesus was only on one ship? But there were other ships going along with them. Can I say, friend, that when you're going something, going through something, the Lord is on board your ship. But there's always others watching and others maybe going in the same journey. You never go through anything alone. We're written epistles known and read of all men. And there's always somebody watching and there's always somebody around us. Notice, if you will, the precipitous tempest. Look at verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. This thing was not only rough and wind, and I want to tell you something, wind storms can be damaging. And I've seen ships where the waves are coming over the deck onto ships, but this thing, Brother Clint, said that the ship took on the water and that the ship was now full of water. Now, of course, one man once said that as long as Jesus is on board your boat, it won't sink. But let me say, literally, this boat full of water didn't sink. Amen. What a Savior, huh? Amen. Notice the panic in verse 38. 
And he was asleep, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say, say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? The panic was theirs, not his. He'd sleep on a pillow. And they're the ones panicking. How many times has something come our way and we panic? We panic because we forgot the promise. Hmm? I told you all Wednesday night I was going to have to have a heart cath. And I told you all Wednesday night it'd be okay. And when the call came out, and I appreciate Brother Josh sending out the call. When the call came out, I was in the hospital. Some of y'all panicked. There was one guy laying in a hospital bed that wasn't panicked. Matter of fact, my heart rate dropped to 38. I was so upset. Huh? I'm just trying to tell you, when we forget who's in charge, we're subject to panic. Hmm? Wednesday night did not catch the Lord by surprise, and I've learned a long time ago that long before it ever gets to me, the Lord's in control. Hmm? Uh, matter of fact, I got chewed out by Dr. Sheila Friday night. She called me crazy because I showed up at the board. I had the, I had the angiogram at 310. I was here at 701. I'd been here at 601, but they wouldn't let me out of the hospital. Finally, I had to go talk to the nurse. Say, I got to go. Hmm? Say, what happened? I went. Uh, say, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say the Lord's in control. I probably shouldn't be preaching today, but I am. So there you go. Huh? I told Miss Kathy, I said, no, I'm tougher than shoe leather. It's all right. Okay. Really, I'm not. I just put on a good front. All right. Notice the peace in verse 39. And he arose, rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Can I say, when you've got the peace of God, nothing else matters. And all it takes is a word from him, and sweet peace shows up. Notice, if you will, the probing, verse 40. Mm. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Isn't it terrible when the Lord starts questioning you? How come you didn't believe me? Why are you afraid? Don't you think I can handle it? Hmm? I don't know if the Lord's ever talked to you that way. He has me. Uh, uh, the Lord begins to ask them some questions. He didn't say, how come you had little faith? He said you had no faith. Hmm? You know, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then notice the puzzlement, verse 41. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I don't know about you, but there's been times the Lord amazed me too. I think... I know he's the great God of glory, but man, how'd he do that? Hmm? He's God, friend, and he's not limited by anything. Now, I want to focus on this. In verse 38, we find the Lord asleep on the pillow. Now, I want you to notice he was not awakened by the wind of the storm. Verse 37 says there was a great storm of wind. The wind didn't break, wake him up, Brother Bob. He wasn't awakened by the waves beating into the ship. And it said, and the waves beat into the ship. Didn't wake him up. He wasn't awakened by the water that saturated the ship. Now, I personally don't know how being in the hinder part of the ship on a pillow kept you from getting wet, but the Bible said the ship was full. That didn't wake him up. I don't know about you, but if I'm in the bed and my feet start getting wet, I'm waking up. It didn't wake him up. You know what woke him up? It was the cry of the distressed. Verse 38, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
how to preach with God's help on what causes the Lord to respond. It's not the wind in your life. It's not the storms in your life. It's not the waves or the times you feel like you're drowning. That's not what causes the Lord to respond. It's the cry of distress. Can I say that he responds to the cry of sinners wanting to be saved? Hmm? Listen, no sinner will cry out to be saved unless he realizes he's lost. The Bible said that Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. Uh, the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. Uh, and when a sinner uh, cries unto the Lord, uh, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, uh, he responds to that call. Uh, he doesn't worry about the storms of the world and the waves. Uh, but when a sinner wants to be saved, uh, uh, the Lord will meet him where he's at, uh, and he'll save him and change him, uh, wash him in his blood, uh, seal him with the Holy Spirit of promise, uh, make a new creation reach out of him uh, in a moment in an instant uh, he responds to the cry of sinners uh, desiring to be saved can I say he responds to the cry of sufferers needing some relief listen the storms will beat on you all day long but if you don't acknowledge you need the Lord's help he'll never show up but if you're in the midst of suffering, and by the way, those that should, uh, live godly shall suffer persecution, you will face sufferings in this life. Uh, you'll face physical suffering. Uh, you'll face mental suffering. Uh, you may face financial suffering. Uh, you may face relationship suffering. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, relief uh, is just a call away. Uh, you cry unto the Master. Uh, he brings relief to sufferers. Uh, he may not pull you out of the storm, but he can speak peace to your storm, friend. Uh, I've got good news. He responds to the cries of sufferers needing some relief. How foolish are we to be so prideful to try and handle things without calling upon the Lord? He responds to the cry of sinners wanting to be saved and sufferers needing some relief. He also responds to the cries of seekers looking for answers. The Bible says, seek and ye shall find. You want to find out the reason for what you're going through and the reason for what's happening and the reason. And all you got to do is call on him. Seek and ye shall find. You start seeking the scriptures for him, you'll find. Not only him, you'll find most of the time the answers for the things you're facing and seeking. I found this. He responds to the cry of the sorrowful wanting forgiveness. I'm glad 1 John 1, 9 is in the book that he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we'll confess our sins. Listen, there's nobody that lives above sin. There's nobody that reaches sinless perfection. There's nobody that will never fail the grace of God. Saved people fail the grace of God. And can I say we fail it every day. And there may be times when you do things you would have never thought you'd do and you fail the grace of God. And there may be times that you may face something and blow it uh, bigger than you would have ever dreamed that you could ever blow it. Uh, but I've got good news. Uh, we've got a darling Savior who's long-suffering, uh, who's full of tender mercy, uh, who's full of grace, uh, who's full of forgiveness, uh, and the cry of a sorrowful, a broken-hearted, uh, a child of God seeking for forgiveness uh, he finds it before the words leave his mouth uh, what a savior uh, who responds to the cry of the sorrowful wanting forgiveness listen had you never failed God after you got saved you would live in a point where you didn't think you needed God and what I have found and I said this in my Sunday school class I hope nobody ever blows their testimony but I've known folks who have blown their testimony whatever that means you know that's a that's a man-made term uh, let, me, let me just say this God never puts anybody on a shelf now men can put themselves in a hog pen but God never puts anybody on a shelf show me chapter and verse for that I can show you in Romans 11 where the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't put anybody on a shelf. 
And a lot of the terminology we have has come through some preachers that think they know more than, than God. Can I help you with something? A little white lie is just as black in the sight of God as any heinous sin you can think of. Mm. But can I say this? Folks who have been felt, uh, who have felt intimidated and felt like that they are lower than a snake's belly and felt uh, uh, from the brethren that they can never ever be used of God or be forgiven again, they have found not only the forgiveness of God sweet to their soul, but they have found a greater appreciation for the grace of God than people who have never so-called blown their testimony. Because mm. they realize... God's not only big enough to save them, God's big enough to restore them. And oh, what a God we have, huh? Can I say he responds to the cry of the sorrowful wanting forgiveness, but he also responds to the cry of a song offered, offered in heartfelt praise. I had no idea if she was going to sing that song. But can I say the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of Israel. That means when you begin to praise God in song or in testimony, it's music to God's ear and God comes and sits down amongst us. And you can praise your troubles away. I learned this a long time ago, that old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. Y'all try doing that sometime when you're really feeling low. Just write them down. You won't get to number 10 and you won't be low anymore. And just keep writing for long. You'll be having yourself a Holy Ghost fit when you see how good God's been to you. Hmm? You start praising Him. He'll uplift your spirit. He'll encourage you. He'll begin to bless you because uh, He responds to that song of praise. Hmm? He sure does. Then I thought about this lastly. What causes the Lord to respond? He responds to the cry of the saints accessing the power of prayer. The most underutilized weapon of the saints is the privilege of prayer. If we could talk to God as much as we talk on our phones... We wouldn't be seeking revival, we'd be in revival. Hmm? If we could talk to God as much as we talk about others, we would absolutely see a move of God. But can I say, we cannot talk to God who is a consuming fire without having been consumed with the fire of God in our soul. Otherwise, all of our talking is just sounding brass and tinkling cymbals to God. But the power of prayer is a weapon that God responds to. He responds when our prayer is in reverence of who He is. Who are we that the darling Son of God would leave heaven, robe Himself in flesh, put himself through this old wicked world, uh, uh, sin everywhere around him and him being perfect in holiness, uh, even though he was all man, he was still all God. Uh, and he walked up Calvary's mountain uh, and he laid down his life for you and I. He was buried and rose again uh, and then uh, uh, commissioned the church to go and the church has went for some 2,000 years uh, and when you was lost without God, uh, made certain somebody came to you, uh, told you about him, him. Uh, hey, and when you called upon him, he saved you. What a blessing. Who are we to be saved? Uh, and we call on him in reverence and recognize who he is and how holy and how just and how right he is and how worthless we really are, uh, how worthy he is of all glory and praise. He responds to that prayer. He responds to the prayer for revival. If we truly pray for a revival, we'd have it. Brother Ron, we don't pray for revival because we're afraid of what it's going to cost us. Hmm. Huh? Been announcing for months we're going to have a revival meeting. Got two great preachers coming. Y'all love Brother Cody. You've, you've known him. If I didn't have Brother Cody, there'd be a revolt. 
Most of you don't know Brother McNeese. He's another Georgia preacher. He's going to load your boat. Now, I know some have to work. I know some are providentially hindered. But I know others that have taken vacation so they can be here. But here's the whole thing. been announcing about revival, and I, I already know it's coming. I'm, I'm trying to purpose in my newly found perfect heart not to be dismayed over the goofiest excuses I'm going to get for why people can't be in revival meeting. That's why we don't have revival. Because other things are more important than God. Other things are more important than the church. Other things are more important than souls. When we truly begin to pray and ask God for revival, you know the first thing He's going to revive? You. He responds to the saints calling out in prayer for the redemption of sinners. I guess we're going to have to go back to Saturday night prayer meetings. Because when we was praying for sinners on Saturday night, folks were getting saved at the jail. He's getting saved here in the church. Quit having Saturday night prayer meetings and people quit praying for sinners to be saved. Didn't even get to have jail service this morning because something broke out in one of the blocks. I wonder if we'd been praying if we'd had jail services this morning. Hmm? Boy, it got real quiet. You know what that means? That means you haven't been praying for sinners to be saved. Hmm? Hey, amens aren't the only thing that speaks to the preacher. Hmm? Uh, he responds to the prayer for rest for the saints. You know we're commanded in the Word of God to pray for the brethren. Hmm? We're commanded to pray for one another. And there, do, there is a rest that remaineth for the people of God. I wonder if you've been praying for God's people to find rest in this wicked world. Hmm? He responds when you get to praying for the brethren. Uh, can I say, he responds when we begin to pray for the removal of anything in our life that he's displeased with. When's the last time you crawled up into his lap and said, God, see if there be any wicked thing found in me. See, we don't pray that prayer, Brother Clint. We pray, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. We don't say, Lord, what don't I need in my life? And can I say, a lot of times it's not wicked things. It's just things that's taken the place of Him. Therefore, it really is wicked. Hmm? When's the last time you asked God to remove anything in your life He wasn't pleased with? Yeah. Then I thought about this. He responds to the prayer for the revelation of true holiness. Well, I'm guilty. When's the last time you asked for God to reveal His holiness in you? Hmm? We don't pray for holy. We pray for grace. Pray for mercy. Pray for peace. But we don't pray for holiness. Yet the scriptures say, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That tells me he's given me all the tools we need to live as holy as we can in this mortal body if we but access him. See, to be holy means to let him live through us. And we don't do that very often because we got a real problem with the person we look at in the mirror every day. And we tend to like him or like her a whole lot more than we desire to have the Lord live through us. You want to impact this world? Crucify yourself and let Jesus live through you. It's the only way it'll happen. Because let me help you something. They've seen enough Baptists. They've seen enough Christians. They've seen enough churchgoers. You know what they haven't seen? Jesus in us. He makes all the difference. Read the book of Acts. How they took note that the disciples had been with Jesus. Hmm. They know 
whether or not we're real. God help us that we're not an indictment against every argument that they have for not coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. God help us. Let me ask you this. Is the Lord asleep in your life? Are you more threatened by the storms and by the waves, the wind and the water that you're dealing with all that and you haven't bothered to call upon the Lord? He responds to the cry of distress. When we get desperate enough, he'll get big enough. God help us to come to the end of ourselves and turn it over to him. Then you'll find peace be still and a calm that you've never known. I wonder this morning, are you willing to make the cry that causes Jesus to respond? I don't care who gets a hold of heaven. I just hope somebody gets a hold of heaven. Oh, well, we need a move of God towards earth. This world isn't getting better. And if somebody don't get a hold of God, it won't be long we're going to be flying a Chinese or a Russian flag in America. God is willing. Are you and I willing to call on the Master? Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come get a song of invitation. God help us to get a hold of the Master. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless it. You are worthy of our praise. Lord, I shudder to think where we'd be without you, but I also shudder to think where we'd be if we'd have more of you. God, forgive us of our short-sightedness and our selfishness. God, how we desire you. Oh, God, we don't desire your blessings. We desire you. Lord, the storms we're facing are much greater than us. The problems we're facing are much greater than us. Yet too many are satisfied to try and take them on themselves. Oh God, would you once again move towards earth? Would you once again breathe on your churches? Would you once again breathe on your people? Would you once again let us see your glory? And then, God, would you once again let us see a harvest of sinners getting right with God and getting saved by your marvelous grace. Bless now in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Help someone to plug into heaven. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.